Welcome. Glad you're here. We are going to finish up 1 Peter today. Um, let's first ask the Lord to lead us and guide us in it, and then we'll dig in. Father, thank you for this, your word. Will you make it shine? Cause it to go out for people to hear, cause people to want to be hungry for what the word truly says and help us to be faithful in what we do in response to it. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty, we're in 1 Peter. In our study of Peter's first letter to the believers, Peter has led us to look deeply into the salvation that God's given. He's talked about its security in chapter 1, talked about the challenges that we face, talked about our responsibilities as we humbly serve, serving each other and serving the Lord through how we how we serve each other. Now it's time to wrap up his letter. And so you get into 1 Peter 5. And after in 1 Peter 5 and verse 10, Peter assures that the Lord is faithful to do great things in us. Then he goes on and he says in verse 11, to him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. The word dominion just means we want him to have the power, the authority, the rule. We want his him to be the one in charge. And then he says, amen. And that means truly. You'll see in the New Testament in times when when uh, it'll translate it, truly, truly, I say unto you. And what it is saying is, amen, amen. It's saying truly, truly, this is the truth. So Peter says, to him be the dominion, to him be the power, to, for him to be in charge. And he says, truly, we long for that to be. And then Peter begins his final sign-off. Verse 12 of chapter 5 says, Through Silvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand for a minute. Who's Silvanus? Well, it's important to start picking up on, on some of the things that Peter said. And Silvanus was someone who you actually read quite a bit about in the New Testament. If you look at Acts chapter 15, for example, and in verses, uh, verse 22, we're kind of introduced to, to him. Acts 15 and verse 22 says, then it seemed good to the apostles and elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Judas, called Bersabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. Now, Silas, you're going to sometimes read about his name being Silvanus and other times Silas. It's just like when Peter, we read about him being called Simon. We hear about him being called Peter. And, and uh, so sometimes he's even called Cephas. C E P H A S, and you'll you'll find that through the New Testament. So he's known for, by different names. Silas the same. He's called Silas at sometimes, Silvanus at another, and and as you read about him, you start seeing the course of of him being involved in in Second Corinthians chapter one, for example, and verse nineteen. Paul is writing, and he says, "For the Son of God, Christ Jesus." who was preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but yes in him. And what is he's been talking about how you can trust his word. He doesn't give you two different sides to things. He told them how he wanted to pass through their, their area and to visit with them, and it kept being cut off. Every time he tried it, he couldn't do it. And so what it's telling you is, I wasn't trying to string you along. I really did want to see you, but I wasn't able to. He said, I wasn't telling you what wasn't so. You also read about Silvanus in 1 Thessalonians 1, 1 and 2 Thessalonians 1, 1, where, where Silas was with Saul while he was writing those books. And he was an important figure in the early church. And in Peter's book, where he mentions Silvanus, it says, through Silvanus, our faithful brother, I've written to you briefly, and it's possible that, that Peter dictated his letter to, to Silas, who wrote it down. 
But it's likely then that Silas was given the job of taking this letter and taking it to the churches that were the target for, for Peter's writing and to go about amongst them and, uh, and, and deliver this letter. And he may even have read it out loud to them and given them the opportunity as he read to ask questions of him and he would explain what it was that Peter was getting at. Um, because he was so close to Peter in the writing, he would be a very good one to answer the, the questions that they might have. And so when he says, says uh, through Sylvanus, our brother, I've written to you briefly, he's telling you, I trust Silas, and you can trust him too, and you can ask him what you need to, and he can explain these things to you. So it would have been handy to have such a one to come and deliver Peter's letter to us. I sometimes wish that was the case. So here's what Peter says. Through Sylvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, he says, I trust him, you can trust you too. I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. When it says that he's exhorting, the word means that he's urging someone to do something. He's telling them, look, I'm giving this message to you now. With it, I'm urging you in the strongest terms to step up beside me in this. Let's get this work done. Let's get the word out. Let's make sure the gospel is preached in the world. And then he goes on, he says, and testifying that this is the true grace of God. He says, I'm declaring to you, I'm giving you my eyewitness testimony that this is truth. He says, this is the true grace of God. This is a real thing. God actually has poured out his grace to us. And I'm telling you, this is the real deal. And here's, here's I want you to look at a couple of things. In Acts chapter 11, and we're going to look at Acts chapter 11, and starting with verse 19 in particular, where it says this. There came persecution in Jerusalem after the believers began to, to preach boldly the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Christians went out and they started spreading into the area around. In verse 19 of Acts 11, it says, So then, those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen, Stephen the first martyr, he was stoned to death because of his witness for Jesus, they made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. At this early time, many of the Jewish Christians thought this was just the next phase of what God had begun through Moses and giving them the law and the whole Old Testament um, system that had been set up. And they're saying this is just for the Jews the next step in, in coming to the Lord. But what it says here, they began that way, it says in verse 20, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. And so God gave his approval by having people be born again, who were the first non-Jewish believers after those that, that Peter had talked to, Cornelius, the Roman, and those, those with him. In verse 22 here, it says, The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with a resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. Barnabas, it says, was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And when he saw what God was doing amongst these, amongst these people who were not Jews, Barnabas got excited. He said, look, and he was greatly blessed in how God was spreading and expanding his work. Barnabas didn't get upset about it. He got excited about it. And what Peter's saying is, this is the kind of grace we're talking about. It's doing its goodness in real time. It's saving people. They're being born again. And so so uh, he very, very uh, clearly is excited about them knowing and hearing and understanding what it was that, uh, that he had to say. First Peter 5 goes back 
It says this is the true grace of God. And Peter's been talking about that. In chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, Peter talks about God's intentional gift of salvation and of pouring out his grace on people by his own choice. In chapter 4, 8 through 10, verse 10 especially, it says, as each one has received a special gift employed in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God, he says, this is what my message has been. God's grace is poured out. We're motivated to action. In chapter 1, verse 13, it said, prepare your mind for action. Get your mind ready to go to work. Be alert, serious about this. Fasten your hope firmly on the grace that will be completed when Jesus Christ gets back again. That's when we'll see the final outcome of that grace. So here in chapter 5, verse 12, he's saying the grace is real. It's from God. Plant your feet firmly on it. Trust fully in the salvation that I, Peter, have been telling you about in this short letter. He said, I'm sending it by Silvanus, by Silas. He says, when he comes, he says, grab hold and stand firm on it. Then you go to verse 13. It says, she who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends your greeting, send you greetings, and so does my son, Mark. Now, it says, she who is, your, who is in Babylon, and it's talking about their sister church. The Amplified Bible says it this way. She, your sister church here in Babylon, who is elect or chosen of God, with yourselves, sends you greetings. And at the time when this was written, there may not have been any uh, Christian believers or Christian church fellowships yet in the city of Babylon. But for the Jewish people, the name Babylon was almost a code word. When they spoke of Babylon, they meant a place that was opposing God, a place that was opposed to God's people. Well, the main place of opposition was coming from Rome in that day. And so when he says, she who is in Babylon, he was saying in a coded way, those believers, those the church who is in Rome, who are chosen along with you, who are the elect of God, who God chose to bring to himself, sends you greetings. And then he says, and so does my son Mark. Now, when he says my son Mark, he says he means his disciple. He means one who's under him. And it's almost certain that he means John Mark, the one that we read about in the word. And I want to talk about him for just a minute because of a lesson that comes from his life. In Acts chapter 12, we're introduced a little bit to him. In after chapter 12 and verse 12 of Acts, it says, and, and uh, Peter is, has, been, has been miraculously released from prison, and it said, and he found himself out on the street. He had been brought right out of the prison and set free. And it says, and when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And so when it talks about John, it often will say John Mark or about Mark. Later on, he's mostly called Mark as Peter does. Also in verse 25 of Acts 12, it says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who is also called Mark. Now, as they went out, you find out that Paul and Barnabas decided on their first missionary journey, they were going to take John Mark with them. And so they lined it up to do so. In chapter 13 of Acts, in verse 5, it says, They took off, and when they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John as their helper. And you read on, and you see that things got pretty dicey. It got to be, um, they were opposed. There were, there were things that, that kicked up. You get down to verse 13, it says, now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, but John left them and returned to Jerusalem. For some reason, John said, I'm not going on, and he turned around and left. And this actually caused some friction a little later on. When you get to chapter 15, 
and you get down to verses 36 to 39, it says, After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of God and see how they are. So this is going to be a second missionary journey. Verse 37, Barnabas wanted to take along John, called Mark, along with him. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along, who had deserted him in Pamphylia and had not gone on with him in the work. He said he backed out on us once. I'm not taking that guy. And Barnabas insisted he needs another chance. And they got into such an argument and such a disagreement about this that it says in verse 39, there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left being committed to the brethren, by the brethren, to the grace of the Lord, and he chose a new partner, and off they went to do another missionary trip. And if that was all there was to it, it would be kind of sad, but apparently under Barnabas' uh, encouragement, possibly helping to to get him past the idea of feeling a failure because he had backed out before. In Colossians chapter 4, and, and we're going to read verses 10 and 11, as, as Paul is writing to the Colossians, he says in verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Barnabas' cousin Mark, about whom you received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And also to Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, and they've proved to be an encouragement to me. Sometime Paul and John Mark got reconciled to each other, and Paul did not continue to hold against him that in his youth, in his early days, he had backed out of that trip. And here he even includes him in one who is very useful to him. And you go on into, there's a little tiny book just before Hebrews called Philemon. And it's only one chapter long. And in this letter, Paul writes to Philemon. And in verse 24, uh, let's see, I'm going to start at, at verse 22. It says, at the same time, also prepare me a lodging for I hope that through your prayers, I will be given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you as do Mark. Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. And even though it's just a mention, the mention indicates that the record shows that even so someone's messed up at some time, that they can be reconciled and they can be brought back in. And those who are more mature in the Lord need to be patient with, with young people. And when someone's messed up, bring them along slowly and help build them back up. And by the time we read about Mark here and in First Peter, you see someone who is useful to the work, whose life indicates that you're not a failure if you failed at some point, that instead you can be reconciled to God and become useful to the work of the Lord. And so it, it's kind of neat that Paul says, my son, my disciple, the one who I feel so much for, my one who I love, like a, like a son, Mark, sends greetings to you too. In verse 14, Peter says, greet one another with a kiss of love. To Americans, that sounds kind of weird because we've made kissing to be such a sexualized thing. It's hardly, we're hardly able to separate it from, from a romantic kiss. But in many European countries and around the world, people greet each other. Men greet men and women greet women by, with a kiss on the cheek. It shows that they're accepted and welcome. And as a matter of fact, Paul uh, in Romans 16, 16 says, greet each other with a holy kiss. And I'll give you just some scriptures we're not going to turn to. 1 Corinthians 16, 20, 2 Corinthians 3, 12, 1 Thessalonians 5, 26. All of them urge believers to greet each other with a holy kiss. This is a, a, a kiss, a, a recognition, an affection. We call them holy hugs sometimes, and we'll give each other a hug and, and show. And it's a, it's a very clean and not sexual at all hug that indicates that we care about someone, that we 
accept them, that we recognize them as fellow believers in Christ. And Peter says, don't give up on that. Don't quit showing each other that you care about each other. And in the very end of his letter, he's, Peter says this, peace be to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Peace, and as a Jew, it was the shalom of God, the peace, well-being, the prosperity, the goodness that is from God. He wishes on them. And it's a great way to close the letter. And it refers us back to the place in which verse 7 of chapter 5, he reminds them that we can cast all of our cares, all of our anxiety, our fears, our worries, our our, our, our um, things that bother us. We can cast them on him because we know that he cares for us. We know that he is concerned with the things that we're going through. When we hurt, he knows it. When he puts us through testing, he knows it's tough. But we can cast our anxiety on him because he cares. He will help us bear them up. He is one who cares for you. And you can bank on that. You can stand firmly on the truth that God cares about what goes on with you. Peace be to you all who are in Christ Jesus. That's a good way to end. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this, your word. We thank you for this message. Father, there's so much in this little book. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to let it be planted in our hearts so that it produces good work, good things, and not just empty works, but service to God. This is the true grace of God. Help us not only to be filled up with it, to experience the grace as a, a filling blessing, but to get it to everyone that you bring us in contact with. Make the grace and blessing of God be what flows out of us because our words are flavored by it, our minds think in it, our hearts love from that grace, our confidence comes from that grace. We know you care for us. Help us to shuck off the anxieties on you and receive from you the confidence of the grace of God, saving, keeping, guiding, and working through us. Thank you. These things we know we can trust you for. You love us and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. May God's grace, his blessing, his goodness fill you up. And uh, may God be glorified in what he does through you as he works his grace out in you and works it through you so that you have good to give to those you minister to. God bless you and we'll see you next time.